real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, reporting live from the cam. High in demand, so please stand by if you can. What we got is worth a lot, so put a tie on your plans. On court, talking sports through the eyes of the fans. With Trip Young, Emma Marie, Eric Sanchez. You heard what I said, we elite. Check the latest topics and stay ahead of the beat. Keep us in your topics and uh-huh. we ahead of the Yo, streets. It's Johnny Floss, bringing a different type of blend. Backing up Misfit to make sure y'all tuned in. You gotta watch, this show is one of a kind. Updates on your TV screen from 8 to 9. For the older folks, so even if you're younger, no matter what sport, this show, we got it covered. It's filmed live in the middle of BK, so we Ain't no better sports show to watch on Thursdays. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. And then we got we got we got a guest. You want you want to intro our guest? Yes. So we have a special guest coming on today. Um, I'm a great friend of his wife. Um, his name is Devrin Paul, aka Coach DP. Um, he has been such an influence in not only the basketball space, but for women athletes as well. So definitely excited to have him on the show today, and we are going to have him come on now. Happy to be here. What's up, everybody? Man, what's good? Man, happy to be on. Thanks for having me. Thank Absolutely. you so much Absolutely. for being a part. His energy is fire. Well, like, <laughs> why not? Why not? You know what I'm saying? The sun is out. I'm in New York, baby. What, what could be better? <laughs> Time to turn for up. Sure. So um, just to kind of introduce you guys. So, you know, I kind of, I was bragging about you earlier and I was speaking about just knowing, um, definitely growing up with your wife. Um, so this is, you know, Tripp and Eric. And we definitely are so thankful to have you today. Um, if you want to give our audience just a quick, bio about yourself um and then we'll get into some more questions oh definitely no doubt uh first of all i just want to say i'm thankful uh to be on the show uh to be able to be a guest i'm thankful to even be alive at this point where everything is going on uh so i'm just thankful um to be here today uh but overall so i started out as a basketball manager uh i started my career at kentucky state university on the d2 side always played ball in high school Uh, I actually got cut in the seventh grade. I got cut in the seventh grade, and then I realized that I need to work on my game. Uh, So my uncle, he took me under his wing. He's always been a coach, always been around basketball. So he kind of raised me in a basketball sense. Uh, So he he took me under his wing. I made the team, got better, uh, kept developing as a player. Next thing you know, coaching just kind of called me. I went to college at Kentucky State University, a small D2 school in Kentucky. HBCU. So I had a good time. I had a good time in school. <laughs> Great time. Uh, so my uncle helped me to get on with coaching. I became a, a student manager. I started working out with my own friends, really got into play of development, took that to the next step. Uh, next thing you know, I, I got offered a graduate assistant job at the University of Louisville. So I switched from the men's side to the women's side at that point. Uh, went to the U- University of Louisville to work for Jeff Walls. Uh, I was there for uh, two years as a GA. We went to a national championship my first year, so got a chance to experience that. Um, After that, I got bumped up to a video coordinator, Um, really not even from uh, trying to get the job, just from being around the program, being loyal and faithful. Uh, Next thing you know, I got promoted uh, to a special assistant to the head coach. Uh, We went to another national championship game, lost that one, but uh, it was another Final Four under our belt. Uh, went from there to go be an assistant coach at Marshall University, uh, helped turn around that program. I worked with a, a head coach by the name of Matt Daniel. He's now the, the head coach at Arkansas State. Uh, so we turned that program around. When we first got there, they had won nine games. When we left, they had won 22 games. We went to postseason play for the first time in 25 years while we were there. Uh, then I just got the itch to be with my wife. <laughs> uh, so we was dating long distance at the time. We had been dating for two years. Um, And we kind of sat down and we talked about what we want our life to look like and what we want to do together. And we always wanted to be business owners. So we started our own basketball training business in Long Island. Uh, One thing led to another. So I just picked up and left coaching. Uh, I actually got offered a job um, at Albany. I was interviewing for that job and I kind of sat down and I thought about, is this really what I want to do with my next step in my career? 
Uh, so I started talking to my girlfriend, who's my wife now, uh, and we just kind of, we, we figured, you know what, if we're going to take a chance, let's take a chance on ourselves. Uh, so we started our basketball training business. One thing led to another. And I can really just say my wife really built the business because I just, I, I said it. And then next thing you know, she had a gym, she had kids. So I was like, okay, we got to do this. Uh, and then I uh, kind of was missing coaching a little bit. So uh, we, we got some teams together. Uh, so we've been able to put kids in school. Uh, we just we just put in our third third player into college on a full scholarship. Um, and then I, I, I've been coaching other coaches. So right now I currently coach uh, with other universities uh, through a number of different ways. We do some group coaching. I got some one on one clients as well. Uh, but we basically just help people level up uh, on the basketball side. So that's basically what I do. Cool. So that's that's first of all, congrats and just. I commend all the work that you do. Um, for one, I'm happy that I have a Long Islander in here because the guys who rep this city nonsense all day, uh, there's so much talent that comes out of Long Island, New York. And, you know, I'm going to definitely get a, touch on, you know, uh, your wife, someone that I looked up to growing up for years. Uh, but I wanted to try to circle back to the beginning of um, you speaking about your um, uncle, Coach Thomas Patterson. Um, definitely something that I can relate to because my uncle is who helped me get started in the career that I'm in as far as media, um, just giving me the opportunity at first. Um, and you also had made a, a comment about how you felt like coaching kind of called you. And I definitely want you to speak about that because I think so oftentimes people kind of feel like because they played, the next thing to do is to coach. And I think that coaching is a knack that you really have to have a sense of leadership and know how to handle, you know, athletes, and you have to have a passion for it that it's not just, okay, I'm no longer playing, I want to be around the game, let me coach. It's really something that you really have to be called to do. So how was that transition from becoming a player, then to coach, but then going, it's a two-part question, coaching men, then to coaching women? How have those transitions, you know, been for you? Yeah, definitely. That's a great question. Uh, so when I first started coaching, like I said, I, I, I personally, I, I actually told somebody I was walking up the back stairwell at the University of Louisville uh, when I was a video coordinator. And at the time, I had loved player development. You know, that was something that I love to do. Uh, I love to help people get better. Like, that's my main thing. And I figure if I'm going to be in basketball, I might as well individually help these players become the best players that they can be. And I had a chance to, to work out some of the best players in the world. You know, we talk about Adrian McCautry, who was a number one pick in the WNBA draft. We talk about Shoni Schimmel, who was a 13 pick. But my best friend, Candace Bingham, she was the, uh, Candace Bingham, uh, well, she just got married, so she got a new last name now. Uh, but she was, she also went in the, in the second round. So all of these type of players that I was working with, on the women's side, um, and one of my uh, colleagues was walking up the back stairwell as well, and she said, she stopped and she asked me, she said, you know, the girls really listen when you speak to them. Have you ever thought about coaching? And I kind of laughed at her. I was like, yo, man, as yo, soon as you become a coach, players don't listen. Like, I don't know what it is, but like, when you say you a coach, it's almost like being a parent. Like, they don't want to listen to their parents. Um, so I was kind of like, I'm not really trying to do that. Uh, but it just kind of called me and it put me in a, it put me in a great position um, to become a coach when that call came. Uh, but I never really had wanted to do it. Um, but just being a leader in the aspect of always wanting to be the best in my craft. Like, I think that that's one thing that I've always been very, very intentional about. Uh, whatever I'm in, I'm going to try to be the best at it. You know, whether it's me being a husband, whether it's me being a teacher, whether it's me being a business owner, I'm going to give it everything that I have on every single play. So that's what made coaching, uh, going from playing to coaching a little bit easier in the transition, because I've always been a player. I had to work for everything. As you can see, I'm a smaller player. Uh, I had to fight for all, every single bucket I got, I had to fight for. <laughs> I feel like I'm on uh, five heartbeats when he was like, every night I got to fight to prove my love. Um, but I was fighting for every single bucket that I got. Um, so it, it made it a little bit easier for me because I, I developed that inner drive and that inner um, development. So I was, I was very, very hands-on with player development because I know what it feels like. So I can speak directly to your game. So like I, I coach my kids totally different. I, I ask you like, hey, what's, the, what's your favorite way to score? And I want you to tell me because if you say, hey, I like to shoot from the wing, I'm going to give you a couple moves to help you get that shot off from the wing. 
And then I'm also going to help with your weaknesses. So, you know, those are things that I've been able to do as a coach that went straight hand in hand with me being able to, uh, to play the game. Um, and then the, the next part of your question uh, with my uncle, you know, my uncle was a huge part of my life, still is today, uh, because he not only taught me about the game, he taught me about a work ethic. Uh, you know, he, he, we used to go to the park, we would play, and we would play uh, three on three with no dribbles. You get no dribbles, you get one dribble, you, get, you would have to pass and screen away. Uh, so I became fundamentally sound. So when I teach my kids, I always start with the basics. I always start with the fundamentals. And I never get too far away from that because I know that everybody needs fundamentals. Even in our coaching course, we talk about the coaching fundamentals. And what are you willing to do every single day as a coach to get to where you want to go in your career? How, uh, how, how important is player development with younger uh, players? Mm, man, um, to me, player development is a, is a huge part of your game. Like, especially when you talk about a younger player, I feel like you should start with player development. It's almost like, it's almost like personal development with your career. How much could you actually think that you're going to get accomplished at your job or with your career if you don't individually work on your skill set? You know what I'm saying? So I think that player development is a great place to start, but you also need that competitive edge. You also need to be able to build the winning edge. And that's one thing that we teach with all the kids that we train, all our student athletes, even the pros that I train, I always teach that, yo, you got a competitive nature in your head naturally. Like it's a gift that God gave us. So you should instantly be thinking, how can I do more? How can I expand my game? How can I become better? So I feel like player development is an essential when you're talking about getting better as a student athlete. Absolutely. Now, Coach Paul, I got a question for you. You mentioned earlier the mindset of the young athlete when they hear the word coach, uh, where they almost want to tune you out like a parent. Talk about the challenges of keeping the young athlete motivated through practice and through the <laughs> grinds of a season. Oh, man, what an uh, excellent question. Y'all hitting me with some fire questions, man. Thank God. You know what I'm saying? I'm working on my craft. I'm getting better as I go, right? <laughs> We uh, thought about this. You can tell. <laughs> nah, nah, nah. I love it. Um, so one thing that we pride ourselves in with our training uh, with Trust the Grind, we love to, to work on the athlete's mindset. It's actually a course that we teach. Uh, inside of that course, we teach you what it looks like to be coachable. We teach you what it looks like to, to, to have that motivation. But I come from more of an internal standpoint because I love to um, – I love to coach from the jungle, all right? So let me break down the jungle to you, right? So we use an assessment with everybody that we work with, even with my coaches, I teach them how to use this assessment as well. In the assessment, you got four animals. You have the lion who's driven by results. This is the, this is the player that's very aggressive. They are gonna take the last shot whether you tell them to or not. Like that's just, they just I'm just keeping it real, that's the lion. Then you have the, uh, the flamingo. This is the flamboyant, energetic, inspiring. Uh, I'm a 99% flamingo if you can't tell. Uh, then you have the chameleon. The chameleon is very stable, status quo. Uh, that's the person that's always uh, just a, a, a natural team player. Uh, then you have the turtle. The turtle is all about details, all about making sure uh, that things are, are, are detail oriented. they're crossing the T's, dotting the I's. So first thing you got to do is identify what type of player you're actually dealing with. So I always go with KYP, know your personnel. So I'm looking to see, okay, what type of player is this? What type of kid am I dealing with? What type of athlete is this? What's their mindset? Are they a faster paced person? And now I would already know I'm either dealing with a flamingo or a lion. If it's a slower paced person, I'm dealing with a turtle, or I'm dealing with a chameleon. And now I tailor fit my leadership language to reach that person right where they are. I don't like to coach from a, 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 um, a up in the box. You know what I'm saying? I don't like to look down and try to coach on you and tell you all the stuff you're doing wrong. I like to get in the game with you and meet you right where you are and say, hey, you know what? You did make a mistake in the game, but you're getting better because you're learning the concepts. You're learning what you should and shouldn't be doing. Now we need to go in and watch film together and see exactly where you need to utilize the things that we've been talking about. So I, I like to use a standpoint from, um, from coaching in the jungle when it comes to motivating our student athletes and teaching them about the athlete's mindset. That is the best answer I have ever. <laughs> I love the fact that you don't have a uniform way of coaching. Like the fact that you kind of characterize each player to have their own individual, you know, skill set is something that a lot of coaches 
we'll kind of have this uniform blanket when everyone learns differently. You know, some people are visual learners, some people have to write it down. So that's kind of how you have to treat them in regards to their style of play. Um, one thing that I always notice is your Instagram, your motivational videos. I know I always try to repost them and just kind of look for them for encouragement. Um, I've seen one of your videos, you were speaking a lot about how much you live your life by principle and how you compare um, like kind of life lessons when you're speaking to your girls, even on the sideline. Like guys, he had a clip that it was, it probably was like a 10 second little timeout, but he managed to pull in like a life comparison to right there in the moment in the game. What is one of your favorite principles or just your favorite kind of life lessons that you compare basketball with to your, your uh, players? Yeah, um, you know, a huge part of my uh, coaching philosophy and my coaching makeup comes from the Bible. Um, so I'm very driven. Uh, by, the, by the spirit and I come straight out of the Bible. So I teach a lot of things from the Bible. I just don't tell the kids that it's scripture. <laughs> uh, so I guess you could say I got the cheat code. <laughs> uh, but um, one of my principles that I love to give my kids is, you know, give, give every play everything you have um, and make sure that you're practicing loyalty and faithfulness. Um, you know, that's one thing that I, I love to teach with the coaches that I coach as well as with my players uh, is making sure that you give everything you have to each play. Uh, I remember when I was coaching at the University of Marshall, uh, and we we had basically, you know, every coaching staff should have something that they that they stand for. You know, some core values, different things that are some coaching mantras. And one of our mantras was attitude and effort. And I loved it. However, it didn't really explain what type of attitude and what type of effort. So uh, I kind of switched it up and I said, we give 100% effort and we always have a positive attitude. So those are two things like you would see with every kid that I coach and I have a part with developing as a student athlete, I'm always telling them, yo, one thing that you can control is your, your attitude. Like you can make sure, I don't care if the ball goes in 100% of the times or 10% of the time, you can have a positive attitude and it don't have to be soft. That don't mean that you soft just because you feel like the next play is going to be better than your last play. It actually means that you're looking and you're assessing, you're self-aware of where you need to get better at and what you need to work on. So I always tell them, make sure you have 100% effort. And it looks different. And that's something I teach my coaches. 100% effort for me in a workout, like, like yo, my wife, my wife will work out hard hardcore like she a workout like right now she uh, she on a hundred with her workouts i'm not there my hundred percent effort in a workout it, it, it's not gonna match up to hers the trainer asked me today on the on the zoom training session he said oh we gonna do a competition how many can you get and how many can she get and we got done i was so tired i said i couldn't even keep count she was like 25 i'm like i lost because i don't even know how many i had but that's what my effort looks like. So I always tell my, my, my student athletes and my coaches, like everybody's 100% effort is going to look different. So you gotta be able to dip and dodge out of your different animals and your assessment to be able to reach that kid where they are. Right. And it's, it's funny that you said you had a cheat code. So you have two cheat codes, okay? One, the Bible as your principles, but also um, I know the guys heard me mention earlier that his wife, Gabby, was one of my role models and I know this is the coach DP show right now but you already brought her up so I'm going to continue talking about her real quick um but Gabby Gibson you know before obviously before she was uh Paul um won the New York State championship in high school so she was one of the one young ladies that when I was in high school I used to take the train to go over and see the Colpet girls play basketball and um, they were just a phenomenal group of girls. So you definitely have a cheat code that you have a wife that is a phenomenal athlete to kind of help you, I guess, kind of mentor and coach women. Because I always say it takes coaching women, not to say it's so different, but, you know, you have to be cognizant of, uh, I don't want to say we're super emotional because I don't even want to say that. Like, we're just, we're just as tough as guys. But you have to know how to coach women, though. Like, that is a, that is a different skill set, I think, than coaching men um and because you don't want to baby them but you also want to be you know what i mean you have to have that balance of coaching women Let versus me men story so, I, I want to tell you a story about when i first started coaching women um so when i first started coaching women uh matter of fact i was a, i was an assistant coach at marshall at the time um and i was making sure 
you know, I was trying to reach my kids. I was trying to get them to, to step outside the box and do some different type of things. Now, we was trying to turn around a program. So obviously, that's a little bit of a different style of coaching. Uh, so we were trying to get them to all come together on one page. Um, so I was giving a lot of direction to the girls, like what they should be doing, what they should be working on and stuff. But I, I quickly realized that they don't care nothing about no strategy until they know that you care about them. Uh, so that's one thing that I always make sure when it comes to females and I'm coaching uh, my student athletes that happen to be girls. Uh, first of all, I, I, I say, I tell them first, you're a basketball player. Like let's, let's keep it 100. Like you a basketball player. So I'm coaching basketball players and I know how to meet you where you are. So I got to walk up to you first and ask you, yo, how you doing? Is everything okay today? Like I like to feel the temperature. I want to make sure, like, yo, is everything all right? I even go, I go deep enough with my girls today, and I'll say, hey, are, are, are we good? Like, are you, are you having a good day today? Can we go <laughs> first? Can, we, can I meet you there today? I got to really make sure, like, hey, you good? And they'll be like, okay, cool. But after you do that so many times with them, um, they loosen up. And having my wife has been, like, like just like you said, that's another mm-hmm. Cheat code because yeah. at the end of the day, I can always call a two thousand point scorer <laughs> before I go to bed. I can lay down next to my two thousand point scorer and ask her, "Hey, how would you feel if a coach asked you this or or responded this type of way?" Uh, and don't get it twisted. I I've been using my wife in that regard since the first day I met her. I've been re- helping. She been helping me recruit. She been helping me do everything. So. Yeah, my my wife is always here. If she even if she ain't on on the call, she here. She with me all the time. I, I, I love go, that. I love that so much. <laughs> I want to go back really quick because you, you know you're talking about um, different coaching styles for different players, but and at the same time trying to get the best out of every player. So, what what do you do when you come across a player with let's say uh, the the Randy Moss type of attitude um, where you know, I play when I want to play. Someone who knows that they all world talent, but they, but you know, it's, it's all about them. What do you say to that player? That's a great question. That is a great question. Um, so my main, I'm real big on showing kids exactly where they want to go. So I like to know what do you want to do. So my main thing. So let's say you know I I am dealing with a student athlete that thinks that you know, hey, I got the skill set. I have the 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 uh, talent to get to the next level. I ask them, what level do you want to play at? And if the kid said they want to be a pro, I get a pro on the phone. I call a pro and be like, hey, uh, could you tell them what you was doing when you was in ninth grade and what you was working on and what type of attitudes you had? And I let them talk to the pro. So now it makes me, now I have automatically became the guru. So kids don't want to listen to you until they know that you're the guru. So I make sure my kids understand like, yo, you want to go play D1? I coach D1. You want to go to the you want to go to the WNBA? Let me get Angel on the phone for you. Let me get Shoney on the phone for you. So it, it already established the, the the ground. And normally, what happens is coaches don't establish that relationship first, right? You got to build a relationship first, and then you got to be able to show them your body of work. I let my body of work speak for me, so I can connect with that student athlete where they are. So if they are having some issues, and I I keep it I keep it real with them. I love to use a sandwich approach. I give them a positive. Hey, man, you know, I know you may be going through it right now, but, mm-hmm. you know, you are doing well when it comes to your ball handling or whatever they're doing good. And then I'll mm-hmm. tell them, but you, do, you need to get better with your attitude. Like your attitude is what's really hurting you right now, and that's the detour in your, in your career. Look at these things that have happened. And I, 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 I reverse it back. Look at the teams you've been kicked off. Look at this. Mm-hmm. And I'm not telling you you're going to get kicked off, but what I want you to know is we want you here. And we need you here. And we need the best that you got. So I'm gonna need you to come out and play. Now, I think- Coach, um, because you're so hands-on and you, you're making this conscious effort to connect with the student athlete and the basketball player, how do you feel AAU has affected uh, the, the culture of youth basketball? Yeah, um, you know, we have tons of AAU teams. Um, so I know that from a basketball standpoint, it's kind of been um, a situation where you, you're you almost um, frowned upon if you don't play AAU. So uh, I understand that, but I also understand that you don't have to be the best AAU player in order to get a scholarship. Uh, so I, I tell my kids all the time, it's about what you put out there. You know what I'm saying? Like the scouts are going to come and found, find you. People are going to talk about you. But what you put out there, you can never take back. 
So I don't care if you're playing AAU, you playing high school, you playing pickup. When you step on the court, you need to show it everything that you got because you don't know who's watching. Uh, but when it comes to AAU, I think the kids are playing way too many games, first of all. Uh, you got no legs, right? And, and then sometimes it's just bad basketball. Whether it's AAU, high school, middle school, whatever it is, it's just a lot of bad basketball going on right now. And when I say bad basketball, I just mean they're not being taught the fundamentals, right? You shouldn't get to the age of 16 and you got no counter moves. How you can't cross over and get to the basket? Somebody cuts off your right hand, you can't do nothing? That, that's unacceptable. But that's got to fall back on your leadership. Like, like my kids already understand, like, you should be working on your game. Yeah. If you don't work on your game, you're not going to play. And I tell the parents, I love for parents to come watch my practice. Watch the practice. Sit close, because I'm going to talk loud so you can hear everything that's going on. And you, you don't have to wonder why your kid ain't getting in the game. You don't have to try to figure it out. I'm going to tell you exactly what's going on. And these are the things that they need to do in order to increase their playing time if they want to get better. So I feel like AAU is, um, you know, it's some positives as well as some negatives. But I also feel like it's about the individual that is playing. If you're playing to get on the circuit and get your name out there and, uh, and make sure that people know who you are, then it is what it is. But it's way too many games. It's stress on your body. Sometimes those, uh, the gyms are not even sanctioned gyms, meaning they don't even have the right criteria. It's not the right footage. It's not the right space, which hurts your game. Like if you playing on a court this mad small all the time, you get to college, you playing on 90, 94 feet, baby. You out of shape. You ain't never played on a full court. So, you know, those type of things have a lot to do with your development as a player. I think that's an excellent point because I remember for myself, I was on about, I remember there was one summer, I was probably on like three AAU teams and we had so many games. And I remember AAU being fun, but when I, in retrospect, I think it was fun because it kind of reminded me of street ball because there was some tournaments where the refs weren't, it wasn't, you played all day and they weren't calling certain things. You didn't have that time to, yes, you need game experience, but you also need that fundamental drill time and the practices with AAU weren't that often it was like AAU is pretty much just you play games um so you know I completely agree I think it kind of hurts the fundamentals whereas when the full season came around it was kind of like oh wait this is the line is there and we can't you know that's a trap like all those things got affected um what is um a piece of advice that you would love to give to a brand new coach that um, you know maybe doesn't have the experience that you've had or trained the caliber of players that you've had. Um, some piece of advice that you would give to them. Uh, if if I was speaking to a, a younger coach that maybe doesn't have much coaching experience, right? Um, the piece of advice I would give them right away is go to work. Like uh, you know, I, I talk to tons of coaches that have an idea of what they want to do, and they think about how they would like to coach so much that they forget to go coach. You have to go get it. You have to involve yourself in the process. You gotta go, you gotta get out of yourself and go help someone else. So it's not about what you know and what you can do. It's about who can you help and how can you help them get to where they want to go. So I would say go pick a kid. Literally, just go, if a kid is standing in the middle of the street dribbling the basketball, go pick them and say, hey, yo, let me help your game. That's how I started coaching. I literally was, I was sitting on the bus coming back from a game. We was playing Tuskegee. And that, that bus ride is thir 13 hours to get back to Kentucky. So I had a lot of time to think on that ride. And uh, one of my, my close friends that was playing on the team, he said, he said, yo, DP, what do you think I need to do? And I said, man, everybody's sitting on your right side. You can, you, you, every time you get the ball, they're forcing you to go left. You got to at least jab and, and make them think you're going to go that way. And I can show you some stuff. And he said, yo, can you get me get in the gym with me? And I said, sure. That's how I started coaching. That's how I started. I really started getting into play and development is from being emerged in the process of becoming better. You cannot just go to where you want to be in life. You have to work your way to get there. It's not about the title. It's not about you being called a coach. It's about you helping somebody else to improve their life and get the, the dreams and the results that they would like. All right, Coach DP, this is good stuff. You, I hope, I hope you plan on writing a book of coaching after this, because this is, 
this is crazy. I've had a lot of coaches in my life and the things that you're saying is stuff that I haven't even heard before. Um, where can we find, you know, just your services? You know, you spoke about your wife and what you guys do as a family. Um, for any girls that are in Long Island or girls that are in New York City, um, whether it's online or in person, where can we find you and, and you know, have your services? Definitely. Um, so our basketball training business is G3G Basketball Training. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you go to G3GAthleticTraining.com, you can actually uh, look at our website. You can book a session. Uh, we do virtual sessions right now, obviously, because of the times that we're in. Uh, we also do, we have a uh, athlete's mindset. Uh, that is a online course where we teach our student athletes uh, through some um, video tutorials about how to become better on the mental side of basketball, increasing your basketball IQ, because a lot of kids just don't know the game. Uh, and it's nobody's fault. It's just they don't know the game. And then you got coaches. They don't know the game. So, um, so you know, we teach that as well. Uh, and then on the personal side, if you go to my uh, Facebook, Devin Paul, my Facebook, I do a lot of coaching for my other coaches from there. And you can also visit my personal website at DevonTPaul.com. How, um, how important is the mental aspect of it? Uh, from the coaching standpoint, dealing with your players? Oh, from a coaching standpoint, it's just as important as it is from a player standpoint. Um, you know, sometimes as coaches, we could get caught up in what we're telling the student athletes, but we rarely listen to what we're, we're saying as a coach. Uh, so I, I, I always make sure that I work with my coaches on the mental side. I pretty much only coach in the background with my other coaches on the mental side. For example, if a coach comes to me and says they have a problem connecting with a student athlete, I don't say things like, hey, take them to the court, do X, Y, and Z. I, I call plays, but my plays are different. I'll say, hey, this relationship is like a piggy bank, right? So I want you to think about a, a piggy bank that you put coins in. When you little, you drop the little coins in the piggy bank. So if you want your relationships to get better as a whole, you drop coins in there. Coach, what are coins? You want to connect. First, you want to connect with that student athlete one-on-one. -on -one. You want that to overlap or overflow into something that they enjoy doing. For example, if I'm dealing with a kid that loves to go out to McDonald's, I'm not going to try to connect with her in the gym. That's not the best place for me to, I'm gonna go to McDonald's. I'm gonna go straight into her stomping grounds, right? Now, now I have already shown you that I'm making an investment, right? I'm investing in you and our relationship. Now I'm going to nurture that relationship and tell you like, hey, let's try this again next, next week. Let's, let's link up again. Let's, 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 let's connect again next week. Now I'm going to run that play over and over. Now I'm organically building my relationships as I run these different plays. So I teach my, my coaches from a basketball standpoint, just like I'm telling my kids, you need to have an athlete's mindset. I'm teaching my coaches to have a coach's mindset when it comes to what you're supposed to be thinking about and the different things that you're supposed to be doing. I even teach them, you know, if you're teaching a student athlete, if, if you're dribbling with the right hand and the defense cuts you off, second nature is make a change of direction move, whether it's a crossover behind the back, spin move, whatever you want to do, but you got to change directions. I tell my coaches, if you're dealing with a kid and you're not getting through on one side, change directions. Why you keep trying to go the same way? Why you keep trying to tell them the same thing over and over? That's your fault. If you keep saying the same thing over and over and getting the same response, you need to change up your method. And that's why I teach the, the animals, because you got four different methods that you can use. Don't get caught up on just one. Recently, this April, the NCAA um, have made more steps towards allowing student athletes to get paid for likeness and for endorsements. What are your, kind of your thoughts of that? It's an open debate that we've had on our show here for quite a while. Um, does that kind of change the attitude of the players? How do you determine pay? Um, but, you know, you working hand-in-hand -hand with, with players, how do you feel about, about getting paid for, you know, their likeness? Uh, yeah, I mean, first of all, I think that uh, the NCAA is making a fortune. Uh, I'm going to just keep it 100. I think that they are doing very well on the business side when it comes to an income and a revenue. So I am a businessman overall. So in business if you're making a ton of money on your revenue and you're not paying the employees, obviously you're going to come out on the higher side. So I think that business-wise, it should be done. 
Now, when it comes to the ins, ins and outs, it's going to be very difficult to decide, does the top player get the same amount as the last player on the bench? And that's been the main conflict between the NCAA when it comes to paying the athletes. How do you pay each athlete? So I do think that that is something that can be worked through. But I do think that it, it is a business. And coaches always tell players, let's keep it real. Coaches tell players in college, this is a business. Like, like you need to get your life together. This is a business. So if it is a business, they should be paid. I, I just feel like that's just, that's a no brainer. Like it should, they should be able to profit off of their hard work. Uh, now, I don't think that it should be a huge profit, uh, but I do think that that's pretty rough if you're dropping 25 points a night and you come home and you got nothing to eat and you can't afford to go get a pizza. I agree. Really, really quick, because I know we got to get out of here soon. You, you you spoke earlier about the four different animals, and I would I would assume uh, the lion would be a, a MJ or a Kobe, right? But could you give us an example of those other three animals as far? It could be NBA players or WNBA players, but just kind of break that down for somebody at home that might not know what kind of a player is, is what animal. Yeah, definitely. So so I would say first of all, I think MJ is definitely a lion. Uh, super aggressive, uh, all about getting the job done. Uh, when it comes to chameleon, I would say definitely Scottie Pippen uh, would be more of a chameleon style player. Uh, when it comes, to, uh, only because he is all about, you know, making sure things get accomplished. If you remember on the last dance, Scottie, uh, there was a clip where uh, uh, Phil Jackson drew up a play and the shot was going to Coach, But Scottie, he went off in that game. So he got into his feelings which chameleons are very emotional. So he showed, he went into that chameleon uh, status when it came down to it and he went and he sat on the bench. So you got to be very aware with the chameleons because they will get super emotional on you. So Scottie Pippen, I would say he is a chameleon. Uh, when it comes to a uh, flamingo, I would say that's more of a uh, flamboyant player, you know, maybe a James Harden. I would say he's probably a flamingo building his own brand, doing his own thing. Uh, he's all about, you know, being in the limelight, but he may not win a, a, a chip though, but he's, he's going to definitely get his. Uh, then when you look at the turtle, you know, the turtle, I would say is like a slower pace. This would be more of your point guard and more of your Chris Paul, uh, making sure everybody else is kind of making sure they're doing what they need to be doing, but also being able to see the court uh, with that court vision. Uh, that would normally be a slower paced person. I would even say more of a John Stockton back in, uh, back in the day when you think about players like that. Uh, Coach, one last question for you. Um, because of your, your insight and knowledge of the women's game, and there was a lot made over the last few years of the wage gap between the men's and the women's game, what do you think needs to change uh, so that the women are getting paid on an equal scale? And what can be done to improve the visibility of the WNBA game? Oh, um, man, I was just... Excellent question. <laughs> I was just talking to my wife about this. Um, the first thing I think is they have to kind of... I think they should make it more of like their own league. Uh, right now, as it being the WNBA, I feel like it, it's kind of always going to be the shadow of the NBA. Uh, and it kind of makes it like a second option. Like, oh, like the NBA is not on. Watch the WNBA. But I think that it should be more of a like, this is the women's league. Uh, and then I also feel like, uh, you know, the arenas that they play in, like, there's no reason a women's team should be playing in Madison Square Garden. Like, you know, when they were playing there, like, I, I, I went to a game, so I went to a game at um, Columbia University, the Liberty were playing in, a, um, it was like a preseason type exhibition game. And, and the environment was great. The, the atmosphere was great. Like, I feel like those more closed in arenas would bring that type of feel to the game and making it more like it's like, like it's a great time for your family to come enjoy this game and kind of building a niche. I think they need to find a real niche for women's basketball and promote it as if it is a real business instead of just putting them in random cities that NBA teams are in or they feel like they may be in. Um, I think that that's, that's what probably needs to be the biggest change. Uh, but I do believe that they, they should definitely be getting paid uh, at least similar wages. There's no reason, there's no incentive for women to play, for women to play. Like, I just go overseas. Like, all of my girls are like, yo, I play overseas. That's where I make a majority of my money, and I come back for the endorsement deals. That's just the way that it goes. I think that's a great point, because I think they do, they have always treated 
the WNBA, almost like the second, like the second stepchild of the NBA. Like it's always like the second hand and comparing it to that is going to just have us still, you know, trying to compete with the NBA rather than being our own entity. So that's something I never thought about it in that regard. Um, but thank you so much for just, I really enjoyed this. This was extremely informative. Um, I love all the work that you do for our, our female athletes and our athletes in general. Um, just give the people all of your social media handles and just once again, where they can find you. Definitely. Like I said, first of all, I'm thankful uh, for you, for everybody bringing me on. Anybody that's listening, I'm thankful for that. Uh, my Instagram is uh, Devrin Paul. Um, uh, it's Devrin, let me make sure, D-E-V-R-I-N-N <laughs> underscore Paul, P-A-U-L. Um, and then my, basically all my handles are Devrin Paul. So if you put my name in, you're going to see a lot of my handles. My LinkedIn is the same thing. Uh, and my my uh, Facebook is the same thing as well as my um, my YouTube. So definitely follow my YouTube channel. I put up new videos every Friday. We also do coaching corner interviews where we interview current coaches. Uh, we just had an athletic director on last week. We had the associate head coach from University of Louisville on last week. Uh, so we have coaches that come on and share their story and give different knowledge to coaches that are on the call. Um, so those are all my handles. And like I said, I'm thankful. Uh, and I just want to leave everybody that's listening with one piece of encouragement one piece of uh, knowledge to help you to get through your week. Uh, make sure when you're looking at the areas in your life and you're trying to get better and level up and you're trying to close the gap, make sure that you're not making excuses, but you're making the adjustments, right? I'm gonna say that again. Make sure you're not making no excuses, but you're making the proper adjustments. So when you go through your week today, no excuses, only adjustments. Yo. First off, when we get back in the studio, I need you to come back because his energy is amazing. Thank you That's so much. Flamingo! <laughs> <laughs> Coach, we definitely appreciate you, man. You dropped a lot of gems on us today. I'm yeah. thankful to be here, man. Anytime y'all want me to come back, just hit me up. Yeah, I, yeah, think I got what, what, you. I think what we should do is uh, once things, you know, slow down with the coronavirus and you can actually get back to full steam with your doing, I would love for us to come out see you there working um with, with with the young ladies and then from there we then we'll set it up to come back into the station right from there no doubt yeah, we, we can definitely cover you know whatever event you have and do some video work and just some interviews and and just keep it going we definitely support you and i'm looking forward to see that you know how your career blossoms and i support i support you guys too so it's the feeling is mutual <laughs> thank you so much be uh, safe Thank you. Same to you. Y'all have a good night. And that's a wrap, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in for another episode of Real Fans, Real Talk, Quarantine Edition. I'm your girl, Emerald Marie. We have Legends in Two Games and Trip Young. Peace.